wave function collapse. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you haven't. Maybe you think it's just a quantum mechanics thing. Maybe you already know what this video is about. Well, I'm no physicist, just a guy making a game about a robot who loves plants, so let me explain what quantum mechanics has to do with a silly botanical robot game and why I'll be implementing the wave function collapse algorithm into my game. So since the dawn of gaming, randomly generated content has been a mainstay, figuratively blowing up when Minecraft became popular. And this is awesome, infinite random generation means infinite content, right? Well, not exactly, I think. As a solo indie dev, randomly generated content is a quick way to get a lot out of relatively little code and effort. But there's a catch, infinite randomly generated content can also be infinitely boring, so you do have to be a little careful with how much you rely on it. This is where I think some games have gone a little wrong, but that's another conversation. Anyway, back to robot plant game. I want randomly generated content for it, but at the same time I want to make sure that it's easy to keep it interesting and not too samey throughout all the levels. How do we do that? Well traditionally I would say use some noise algorithm to generate an image and process it down until it looks approximately like a level layout. That's a fine approach, it's worked for a lot of people, but I want to be able to easily change up how levels look and feel without much effort and be able to give constraints to my level generator easily. Like this plant needs to be at the center of a large room, or water should never border lava, and other things like that. And that is where wave function collapse comes into the picture. An algorithm that takes a source image and can generate infinite random images from that one source image. In our case, random but similar level layouts. So we want to generate levels, not using noise, but with more control over generation and with restrictions on where specific objects should be, wave function collapse is perfect. I spend about 30 seconds in GIMP drawing out a 2D version of what I want a level to look like, I feed it to the algorithm, and I get back infinite level layouts that look like the one that I drew originally. So how does it work? Well, wave function collapse is an algorithm that basically solves a set of constraints extracted from the input image to generate infinite novel outputs. What it does is it takes our input image and breaks it up into patterns of a predetermined size. These patterns are then all the possible values for every pixel in the output image. So you can see that each pixel starts as a superposition of all of its possible values. This is where the physics terminology comes from. The algorithm then proceeds as follows. Find the pixel with the least entropy, that being the one whose color we're most sure of, and collapse it into one of its possible values. Then we propagate this information out to neighboring pixels, which is the core of the algorithm. See, not any pixel can be alongside just any other pixel. The patterns that the input image was broken up into also determine how pixels and groups of pixels are allowed to connect with each other and in what amounts in the output image. This is the information that we're propagating out. If a pixel collapses to a certain value, then it's highly likely that some of its neighbors can no longer become certain colors while keeping to the adjacency rules defined by the original image. This process, observe, collapse, propagate, observe, collapse, propagate, just continues until every pixel is in an observed state. Or there's a contradiction somewhere in the algorithm fails, but don't worry about that. And that's basically it. And as an aside, which isn't really relevant to our level generation, the algorithm doesn't even need to work directly with pixels. I'll link a demo tool in the description which has a model of wave function collapse that works on tiles made by Oscar Storbao you can play around with to get a better understanding of how things work. So now that we've got our basic overview of the algorithm, let's go out and implement this for real. So the very first thing to do after getting in the header boilerplate and a bunch of utilities headers included is defining the type of our wave function collapse struct. The template parameters here being the backing type for our pixels, the number of dimensions since we kind of want to write the code as generically as possible for later reuse, the size of the patterns, the size of the bit set, or really the number of patterns that we're going to use, and a vector type. Next up, we forward declare some structures, our pattern, which will represent a pattern of course, our element, which represents a wave element, and the wave itself that will be collapsed. Then we define some useful function types, those being the function which selects the next cell to collapse in a wave, the function which collapses a cell or picks its pattern, and then finally a simple callback function. This will be used to make visualizations while the wave is being collapsed. Then we can define the pattern struct, which is give it a unique ID, the frequency with which it's found in the source data, the value or literal pixel value that the pattern has, and then the data around the pattern in the source data, which is used to compute whether or not a pattern can be adjacent to another pattern, and then a bit set of the IDs of valid patterns on every other side of this pattern, which is just used for speeding up the propagation process. 
With our pattern struct defined and some hastily implemented comparison and hash operators, we can get to the WFC struct itself, or the parameters for the actual wave function collapse. Starting out, we have our input data and all possible patterns for each pixel, followed by those functions that I mentioned earlier. Then a bit set representing a mask of the pattern IDs actually used, a random generator, flags for extra parameters, and that propagation function that I mentioned earlier. We also define for extra generic completeness and reusability the behavior of the input when it reaches a border with this border behavior enum. So with that all out of the way, let's crack open our constructor and start actually gathering patterns from the input data. So the first thing to do with this very convenient and dimensional array for each function is to loop over all of the pattern data and try and construct a pattern at every possible location in the source data. Pretty simple. To do that, we need to first define this data add function, which gathers the data for a pattern at a specified position in the input data. But first, fixing a quick design mistake and replacing this make pattern function with an actual constructor for the pattern structure, like there should have been before I started recording this. Then we define the data add function, which gathers data, of course, according to that border behavior parameter. Now to make sure that we don't end up spending any more time with this algorithm than we need to be, we define a deduplicate function that removes duplicate patterns in the current pattern set. And then there's all this stuff, which basically adds for every existing pattern that was gathered out of the input data, if the flags specify it, all the possible permuted rotations and reflections according to the dimension of the wave function collapse that we're performing. I would go through a more in-depth explanation of this, but this video is going to be kind of long already, and this part would take a while. So we're just going to really quickly skim over this. You can just assume that all the code that I'm writing is uh, doing what I say it's doing with all of those patterns, and you can look at the GitHub if you actually want to see how the multidimensional reflections work. Rotations happen only in two dimensions, however. At the end though, we deduplicate again because you could imagine that adding reflections and rotations of certain patterns will probably also lead to adding a bunch of duplicates into the pattern set, which we don't want to deal with. Now that we have our pattern set, we can actually figure out which patterns in our set can be adjacent to each other on what sides, or how they can be neighbors. This is just brute forced with a sweet sweet O n squared time complexity for the number of patterns in the set. I did bring the total processing time down though, if not the time complexity, by slapping an OpenMP parallel 4 on top of the for loop, which should uh, speed things up. Then we need to do frequency calculations. This is some of the more complicated stuff and its usage in this algorithm, so I won't go too in depth with the explanation. Basically, each pattern has associated with it a number representing the number of times that it occurs in the source data. This is how we ensure later on in the algorithm when we're selecting which pattern to collapse different wave elements to, that we end up with approximately the same ratio of patterns in the output data that we got in the source data. All that info and the processing around it is contained within this one frequency number on each pattern. After creating that mask of which patterns are actually going to be used out of our whole bit set, we can actually initialize and start to generate and collapse a wave. So we started by defining our wave interface, which just has a collapse function on it and will tell you if it had a contradiction somewhere below its collapse of a wave. And then we can go on to define our wave struct, which includes all of the WFC parameters, the size of the output wave, the vector of elements that will make up the wave while we're collapsing it, optional preset data, and the total number of elements that have been collapsed. Finally, we will define our wave element, which basically just stores the position that it's at and a bit set representing the superposition of all of the possible values that that wave element or pixel in our case could take on. Additionally, there are some values for calculating the entropy, but we're not going to worry about those. Elements also store their own value once collapsed, which makes it easier to convert them back into our output data. After defining the initialization routine for each element, we go on to write the apply function, which is one of the most important functions in this entire algorithm. It basically takes a list, or a bit set in this case, of the possible legal patterns left for an element, and then merges it with the element's current possible patterns. This is basically how the algorithm collapses pixels. If we've applied a mask that only leaves one possible pattern remaining, then we know that the element has to collapse down to that pattern. 
And after the definition of a few extra functions for collapsing and other housekeeping, we have our wave element. And finally, we can write the bulk of the algorithm, which is the wave collapse function. This will start out by initializing the element vector using the element initialization function we wrote earlier. This is also an easy candidate for parallelization with OpenMP. After initialization, the function will load and pre-collapse any preset wave values if they're specified. Before moving on to our core loop of observe, collapse, and propagate. The first function to define here being the observe function. It's pretty simple. All it does is it takes an element according to the next cell function that we gave the wave function collapse, and then it collapses it using the pattern function that we gave the wave function collapse. That's what selects which pattern that is going to collapse to if there are multiple options. And finally, we have last but not least, the single most important function in the algorithm, the propagation, which takes the changed value of a wave element and propagates it throughout the rest of the wave, telling each element's neighboring elements how its superposition needs to be updated according to the value of the element being propagated. This is done through constructing what I've come to call super patterns, which is a superposition of all the possible patterns and their values around each element that an element could still take on according to its superposition, and then applying that out to each neighboring element of the wave element whose value is being propagated. In the process, if there remains only one possible value that an element can take on, then it's also collapsed to that value and propagated out accordingly. And well, that's, uh, that's basically it. We start by propagating the collapsed element. We find its neighbors, we construct its super patterns, then we apply them out to neighboring elements. If those elements' superpositions change, then we propagate those elements as well until there's nothing left to change. The collapsing elements in the process, of course. The final thing to do though, once the wave is collapsed, is to take all of the values out of the collapsed wave elements and write them back into the output image. Add in the pattern selection and next cell selection functions really quickly, and then we have our entire wave function collapse algorithm ready to go. This is obviously not the first time that I wrote this code, and this is kind of a carbon copy of what I have existing in my code base. So on top of that, for the specific purposes of this video and because it looks cool, I used SDL to make a really quick visualizer, which created those visualizations that you saw earlier in the video. This is where that propagation callback from earlier came in handy, for those of you wondering. So with the whole algorithm implemented and working, you're probably wondering, how does this actually look in practice as a level generator? Well, I really quickly drew this sample level map, so let's slap that into our new souped up level generator, including wave function collapse, and to see how it looks. Well, it looks about like we took one of those images that we generated and then we applied it very roughly to the level generator. Nothing different than what we expected, but this level generator will really shine when there are actually more restrictions that need to be introduced from different gameplay elements and more different types of levels. Basically a good jumping off point for us with a cool algorithm behind it. A different approach to some random levels. Wave function collapse and level generation implemented, it's also been about two months since I last posted a video about the game, so let's go through a quick lightning round for everything else that's changed since my last video. First change, as you saw in the level generation demo, is the tiles which are blocking the player are now turned transparent. This is just to make sure that the player can always be seen even if they go behind a wall. This was easier said than done though. The solution involves getting a mask of the player entity's bounding box and then casting rays through the world into that box to see which tiles they hit. It's still relatively primitive, but it works after a lot of trial and error with different strategies and the player can always be seen now at least. The second and largest change slash refactor is that I decided to abandon the entity component system architecture in favor of a more traditional object-oriented approach to entities. Basically, as I was trying to implement more entities, I found the ECS hurt more than it helped in terms of code complexity, so I used a few days to refactor a very large portion of the code base, and I haven't really looked back since. With the refactor done though, this means I could give our robot botanist some new toys to play with, and by toys I mean plants of course, those being the daisy and sunflower that you can see here. I've also started work on a very important gameplay element, this glowing shrine here based on the player model. More on that in the next video though.
And for some of the smaller changes, specular reflections are now defined according to a texture, not a fixed value for each mesh. Items sparkle now when dropped so they can be seen better. Grass now has a bunch of 3D extras on top of it, rendering beautifully quickly due to an ultra-fast mesh instance that I wrote. In this frame alone, there are about a thousand extra meshes with a hundred indices each, and the performance impact is negligible. And finally, I started experimenting with adding water. And well, that's about all the changes last time. Now that the base level generator is in, I'm looking forward to making some more gameplay content for the game and getting into real levels. But that'll be next time. So until then, a link to the code for the wave function collapse algorithm is in the description. Thank you as always for watching, and I will see you next time.